Now, what this talk isn't, it's not a knee-jerk reaction against paleo. It's not an attempt to refute everything that paleo believes in. Uh, that would be very easy to do, and books like Marlene Zucks prove that. They, it's pretty predictable. If we look at uh, the philosopher Hegel and various others at you're, you're in history, they have talked about how human uh, history progresses through dialectics. So you have a thesis, you then uh, find that the thesis eventually falls apart under its own internal in contradictions, and then you have the antithesis. The antithesis then stands for a while until it also starts to fall apart under its own internal contradictions, and then you get the synthesis, which takes everything that's rational in both the thesis and the antithesis, and that synthesis then becomes the new thesis and you rinse and repeat until hopefully you uh, reach final true uh, the Weltgeist as he called it and everything is wonderful and true and perhaps we can look at the way people the pendulum swings against various dietary prescriptions backwards and forwards in this light and books like paleo fantasy can be looked in at that light as well uh, I'm not going to do that I want to actually look at what's beyond the pendulum uh, this is going to be a little bit more meta, and we're going to look at those memes and those ideas which uh, propel bad ideas and bad memes in both our communities and the communities that we reject. Um, now, I will name my assumptions before we begin. It's always good to name your axioms. I do believe that evolutionary biology does provide useful data on a healthful diet. Um, uh, as an example, I think it's pretty incontrovertible to me that chronic insulinemia is not usually compatible with healthy longevity. And the general prescriptions of paleo, especially where they help with this, are thus helpful. And the mismatch hypothesis is a useful way to think about things. Uh, longevity specifically does require hacks, though. We can't be sentimental and just do uh, cavemen reenacting. So with all this said, there is something missing uh, in the paleo TM. Because when I say paleo TM, I'm talking about what we want to represent to everybody else that paleo and the ancestral diet is. This, what we see over there, is the parody of what people think of paleo. There's the troglodyte, there's the caveman with his club eating meat and generally acting in what would be considered an uncivilized way, unlike um, the vegetarians who wrote this blog post or who were eminently civilized. Uh, <laughs> but if you, go be, you, if you go beyond the parody, though, and you think, well, how are we going to respond to that? Do we take ownership of that and say it needs some refinements? No. Do some searches in Google Image Search, and these are some of the first things you come up with. Um, you'll, and look, look what's in the heart there. That apparently is the Paleolithic diet. Something's missing. Um, can't quite tell what it is. Um, there's the Paleo food pyramid. Of course, what's at the top of it? Lean meats and fish. Our obsession with this adjective has been noted by many, and we seem still now not able to escape it, except in very niche talks with people like Nora Gagaudis. There is something appealing about the word lean, uh, and it sticks with us. People like Rob Wolf effectively say he still says it because it's a bait and switch campaign. Um, what's really interesting is why does it need, what are we baiting and switching from? What is so appealing about this? And I think we need to dig deeper to find out what it is that we find so disturbing out about viscerality. Um, and we're going to look at the seductive enthymeme to uh, examine these particular uh, ideas. Now, an enthymeme is an, an argument with a major premise removed or ignored. And um, we see this very often, and it's a, it's a rhetorical uh, effect that's very popular with sophists. Uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's one. And because it, what, what's missing there is the first premise, which would say that all smoke is caused by fire. And of course, you, the problem with stating that premise is that then screws up the aphorism, because you can think of many cases where there can be smoke and there's no fire. So the whole little pithy saying falls apart if you examine it too clearly. Um, there is another enthymeme. Let's talk about that a little bit later. Um, and so we get to the stage now where brilliant men like Dr. Asim Alhotra, who is a cardiologist in Britain, has to spend his whole time pouring olive oil over rabbit food to make his case. Uh, and I think this is very sad, because actually if you look at the substance of what he's discussing and the sort of Mediterranean diet that he's prescribing, of course, it's all there, but we have to tap into a thing that, uh, as, uh, the images that society will accept. And the problem with this is that if we can't take ownership of a message that goes beyond olive oil and rabbit food, then we, uh, we have a problem as a community. And 
I think what we're revealing with, with these various problems that we have is a kind of paleo-puritanism which sometimes emerges. More accurately, it's not puritanism, it's actually asceticism. Now, in almost every religion and philosophy, there has been a strain of asceticism, and asceticism denies worldly pleasure, or it sees that hedonism is somehow a spiritual and moral threat. If you enjoy yourself too much in ways that are not allowed, something will happen, karma will get you, and you'll be punished in some way. Um, and philosophers, again, have discussed what, like, what lies behind this popularity of asceticism in almost every culture. And Nietzsche writes about it uh, on the genealogy of morality. And he says, what do ascetic ideals mean? And he basically sums it up is that there, people are fighting to that domineering unhappiness that is part of the human condition all to offer. And what they try to do with asceticism is set their feeling for life at the lowest point. So if you get rid of anything that can promote too much of an emotional or hedonistic reaction, then you don't get the lows or the highs. So it's almost like he's describing in the 19th century a kind of depression, uh, almost a clinical depression, which sadly he, inter alia, eventually befell. And so he says, we try to stay away from anything which creates an emotional effect, uh, which makes the blood, no salt in the diet, the hygiene of the fact here. And he even talks about, um, I think he calls it imbecilic vegetarianism, which he believes is both a cause and an effect of um, this sort of uh, asceticism. And so he says, we, we try to approach something as to what winter hibernation is for some kinds of animals, the minimum consumption and processing of material stuff which can still sustain life but which does not actually enter consciousness. And so that's the basis, perhaps, of some of the ascetic ideals that we think of. And he ironically says, for this purpose, an astonishing amount of human energy has been expended. Um, we then move from the notion of asceticism to um, something perhaps a little bit more cynical, and that's things like the sumptuary laws. Now, in the late Middle Ages, and, and this is just a direct quote from, uh, from Wikipedia, and it's fairly accurate, in, late, in the late Middle Ages, uh, and indeed before then, there were laws which explicitly tried to restrict certain classes of people uh, aspiring to or achieving rich foods, good clothes, and those sorts of things. It was said that those things should be reserved for the upper nobility, either to make sure that the hierarchies were well demarcated, and more cynically, so that the, um, the nobility would have more access to the uh, fatty foods, and everybody else could have their gruel, and they could be very happy about having their gruel, because this was actually morally superior anyway, which was, of course, a wonderful coincidence. And, and, and um, Montaigne wrote about these sumptuary laws, and uh, he wrote how... Um, they, people try to regulate idle and vain expenses on meat, uh, uh, and none but princes shall eat turbot. But of course, then, of course, he realized that this meant that everybody else was desperate to uh, attain it. It became the, well, not forbidden fruit, but the forbidden meat. So there had to be even a, a kind of vicious circle, even more moralizing, saying every time you try to get that special cut, uh, the devil will get you. And when I say the devil, I do mean the devil. Um, uh, there, there are different strains of asceticism in, in, in different cultures, and in the Judeo-Christian culture, there are different strains of asceticism in Judaism than there are in Christianity. So what I'm talking about today is more of the European uh, development that happened through Christianity. Now, the Garden of Eden was literally a vegan paradise. Um, uh, and if you, if you read Genesis, you'll find that every herb-bearing seed, uh, uh, every tree, and that shall be your meat, and uh, thou shalt eat the herb of the field, that was what we ate when we were in Eden, apparently. Um, it could explain our attitude to fruit today. It's a harking back to before the fall. This is a wonderful image by um, Hieronymus Bosch from um, medieval times, and um, it shows people worshiping a strawberry. Um, it could be the uh, Dietetic Association of America, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, now meat, remember, remember this, meat eating comes after the fall. Now, nobody here has to be a Bible-believing Christian. But you have to remember that you live in a society where these memes are powerful. And it, 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 meat eating is particularly associated with our sinful nature. And that has been discussed by people like Augustine and so on from, from the very beginnings of the religion. And le that leads us to carnality. Carnality literally means of the flesh. See also carnival, and possibly, depending on who you ask, the derivation of carnival itself, the overturning of societal norms that 
small time when slightly sinful um, behavior is allowed. Um, so the notion of red meat is redolent with all these images uh, the, the, of fleshly sinfulness. And it becomes very explicit. Uh, there's Galatians, acts of the flesh, sexual immorality, uh, impurity, debauchery, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. But notice it's the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. Now, the use of language is not coincidental here. Um, and when we say flesh, we're not talking about merely human bodily flesh. Of course, we're talking about all fleshliness which leads to, the, the, at the very beginnings of the religion, there were uh, the ideas of Gnosticism, where you not only shunned um, the fleshly, but you shunned the whole of the material world. Um, there, uh, and the, the Gnostics uh, had a very profound influence on a number of, of, of religious strains. Uh, of course, it doesn't take a lot to realize that this is a fear of meaty mortality. Uh, we're, flee we're attempting to flee from the second law of thermodynamics, and the decay and everything that that implies. And it's, it doesn't take a, a lot to realize how this can be appealing if you are af afraid of it. So fear of red meat and fat uh, and carnophobia preceded Keyes et al. by millennia. He, he didn't make his theories, and his theories were not acceptable out of whole cloth. Um, and that's why I think even today, Paleo often can't feel completely at ease with red meat and animal fat. Uh, I, I, I was wondering, I said, am I creating a straw man today? I thought there are plenty of people, you know, we've got people like Nora Gagardis. And then I looked on Twitter and somebody had sent that meme. You know those typical memes are saying, this is what people think when we talk about paleo diet. This is actually what we are. And of course, what people think is all this horrible red meat. And what we're actually eating is lots of leaves. Um, so, okay, good, just in time. Except for fish. Remember? Uh, um, Christians consider, uh, certain Christian sects consider that fish is fine for Lent even though you're not allowed to eat meat and it's also apparently fine for paleo so fish is, is, is given uh, exculpation. Uh, any, uh, I talked to Iva Cummings recently so you're, you might notice this diversion, a quick diversion on Dr. Kellogg because we're cutting closer to the modern era. Now Dr. Kellogg of Kellogg's was utterly obsessed with preventing masturbation. Uh, again, carnality is at the root of all disease. Now today if you read some of his writings it's absolutely absurd. It's the rantings of a madman. He believed that masturbation caused almost every ill in society and was going to bring down um, our, our civilization. He literally said these things. Boys and girls um, each had their own particular problems. Um, masturbation in girls caused miscarriages, birth defects, all ev everything you can imagine. And the pre pre prescription for this for boys, which, which also caused terrible problems for them, were these, inter alia. I won't explain what they do, but gentlemen, you can use your imagination. There were other, there were other, there were other tools that were used as well. Another prescription to end masturbation uh, was food like this. Uh, he explicitly said that uh, he invented cornflakes in order to reduce the libido. Um, that's what it was invented for. He, uh, he, he decided that it needed to be a very bland, non-nutritious food that was dry and as little palatable as possible because that would then get rid of all those carnal urges. Um, in a sense, he's an early exponent of Guyanese food reward hypothesis. Um, uh, and I think there are some... Well, no, no, I won't. I won't. Um, so, so we have this perfect storm of puritanism, purity, and then profit. Now, it's very easy to diss brands these days and to say that brands are the root of all evil. But you remember where brands came from. Um, in the 19th century, there were terrible problems with Real food, as we like to say today, was terribly contaminated. Um, uh, farmers would put various lead substances inside milk to, to eke it out. Um, there were all sorts of azuts uh, things put inside uh, preserves and jams, and it, and, it, and it became a terrible problem. So what brands initially did is that they offered a promise of regulated purity. Um, you combine this with the hysteria going on with Dr. Kellogg and the fact that brands could now be um, distributed across the country. And of course, these things are very easy to distribute. Oats, and it happened to be that they had a very high margin. So you have, you have um, politics, you have uh, eons of, of, of asceticism, and you've got um, an amazing economic opportunity. So it's no surprise that this becomes the apotheosis of healthy eating. And notice again, it's a Quaker on the front of it, um, just to hammer home the point. Uh, and all of this, of course, uh, it, it, to an extent uh, f uh, flows on the stream of the appeal to nature fallacy and that 
is something that we are all guilty of. We are guilty of it, and the people who oppose our communities are guilty of it. And it's not the naturalistic fallacy, by the way. Some people say that that's a related but slightly different ethical fallacy. The appeal to nature is any X which is natural is good. X is natural, thus X is good. Now, of course, you can think of any uh, counterexamples of that, but what I call is I call it the all things bright and beautiful fallacy. I don't know whether this is a very popular hymn in this country, but in Britain, this is the kind of the parody of the cloying, sickly hymn. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all, and it's a pay on to nature. What Monty Python did is that they created their alternative, which was all things sick and horrible, all evil, great and small, all things foul and dangerous, the Lord God made them all as well. And I sometimes, I think we remember that um, as uh, that, that which is, you know, botulism is as natural uh, as, as broccoli. Um, and you add to that, well, there's, there's the begging the question fallacy, and then there's no true Scotsman fallacy. And I'm going to put them together, and I call it begging the true Scotsman. <laughs> now, begging the question fallacy is effectively where you chase your own tail, where you say, um, uh, and that, that, that the appeal to nature is in a sense of begging the question. That which is good is natural, it's natural, therefore it's good. You're not providing any additional data to support your argument other than going around in a circle. The no true Scotsman fallacy is that when somebody finds the equivalent of a black swan and then you kick it out of your definition so that it doesn't have to affect you anymore. So, oh well, X, Y, and Z isn't natural and therefore um, somehow it's still good. Um, uh, and we can see some of these examples of, of these fallacies. I've already mentioned natural. Um, dates. Dates are apparently one, if you, uh, I have to say, if you go into the next room and you look at all those lovely bars and so on, they, there's no sugar in them at all. They're only dates. Um, and that, but that's fine because that's natural. Sucrose isn't natural even if you've taken it out of the sugar cane yourself. Something happens. Um, citric, citric acid, I, I, if, if it's bioidentical, that's not natural. And we, then we have the genetic fallacy. A molecule that's identical, that has a source from something natural or whole, is considered somehow tainted, whereas if it has a source that was created in a lab, uh, uh, sorry, the other way around, if it's created in a lab, then it is tainted. Um, raw. Uh, raw is a wonderful word, which you'll find on lots of labels. Of course, if you try and eat any of those things raw, you'll die quite quickly. Um, and then you've got processed. Um, processed is a very evil word in this community. Um, but we've got to remember that pretty much everything we do with all food at all times is processing. Um, now, we can have discussions about minimal processing and the effects of bad processing, but my point here is to say, if you're going to decry processing, I say, don't just decry it with this kind of greeting card term. Say, I don't like the, this process because this process does X, Y, and Z, which is deleterious on the quality of the food or has a bad metabolical effect. You can't just say, don't eat processed food, because you will be giving up everything on that board over there if you uh, don't want to eat processed food. And that includes the olives. Um, organic is another interesting word. There are probably very good reasons why food created in an organic way is good in certain respects and healthful. However, people are confused about that. That pelleted bait is for organic production. And this really confuses people. There are heavy metal pesticides which people in organic production use, and they're happy to use them, and that's allowed. And the point about this is you need to be very careful about definitions. What do you think you mean by organic? Because it might not mean what they think that you think you mean. Um, <laughs> and here's the other one, jerf. I know why it's a really popular term, and it works really nicely. But to a vegan, jerf means something completely different to a carnivore, and it means something completely different to somebody who's just trying to lose weight on a standard American diet. It's so appealing because it sounds like it's common sense, but it's an enthemy because you're leaving out your initial premises about what you consider real food. And it's begging the question because what is real and then what is food? And of course, if you use it, you'll suddenly decide that something isn't in your food, um, in, in, in your definition of food. And then you can say, well, of course that doesn't fit the JERF definition. Um, so rather than saying just eat real food, tell people what food you think they should eat and why and what the meta metabolic effects could be. It's, and I understand why trying to summarize that in something like JERF is useful, but it can also cause substantial misunderstandings. And of course, the darling of an, an accommodationist attempt is the Mediterranean diet. This is what um, 
doctors who are, uh, who, are, who are promoting the Mediterranean diet in the mainstream often think that it is, or try to pretend that it is. Um, of course, no true Frenchman, no true Italian, no true Greek would recognize that as the Mediterranean diet. That's in the Mediterranean diet. That evil processed food is certainly a huge part of the Mediterranean diet. Notice they never talk about charcuterie. They were healthy whole grains and leaves. This stuff, if you've ever visited the Mediterranean, you'll know that this stuff uh, is all over the place. And that's certainly not the Mediterranean diet. Uh, a whole lamb on a spit, nowhere in the Mediterranean will ever find anything like that. Um, but but, uh, but uh, this brings us back to look at, look at, look at that uh, and, and look, think about the earlier slides about carnality. You can see why people are very uncomfortable in admitting it. It's very easy to look at a pile of leaves and a few whole grains and a pretty tom tomato, tomato, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but when you look at this, it evokes some uncomfortable feelings in you. Uh, now, we have another problem in our community, and that's we sometimes get swept up in the data dance. So we go, okay, this study is demonstrably completely wrong. Now let's use it to support my pet biases. And the example of this is the TMAO study that said red meat's going to kill you by TMAO and you'll explode and whatever. Um, and a prominent member of our community wrote at length about this, completely pulled it apart, talked about the... Um, <laughs> food questionnaires and all the various other things that led to its fallaciousness, and then said, but actually, you know, here's why processed meat is bad. I said, okay, you can talk about why processed meat is bad as long as you define it properly, and as long as you explicitly say what the metabolic effects are, but you don't get to use the huge study that you've just completely discredited as the kind of strange buttress for your further comments. And watch out for this. This happens frequently. If you listen to a pod, various popular uh, paleo and ancestral podcasts, they'll talk about how terrible the latest mainstream study is, and then their own pet appeal to nature things will suddenly get pushed in the end. We'll say, actually, yeah, don't eat hot dogs. Don't do this. Don't do that. And it may be that you shouldn't eat a hot dog, but that's not the study that's going to tell you about it. And then we get the why can't we, we all just get along camp kumbaya stuff. And th the big tent is good, but sometimes in order to get into the big tent, you have to shed your principles and you have to start uh, engendering ever more fallacies because in order to accommodate some very different philosophies, you sometimes effectively have to start telling lies to yourself and to others. So when I hear people say, we have far more in common with vegans than X, Y, and Z, maybe that's the case. But let's be careful that where we have our differences, we are honest and open about them, and we don't try and sweep them under the carpet in order just that we can all get along. And this can have some really distortive effects if we don't do that. Now getting to chemophobia. Uh, I had a discussion with a, uh, with a dietitian and that dietitian said that you really shouldn't eat any foods with chemicals in them. And I said, okay, that's going to be quite difficult. Can you name one? <laughs> and, and as it happened, the dietitian did name a banana, which is great because we've all seen that meme. Um, and there are, there are a bunch of really scary-sounding chemicals in what we would call real or whole foods. There are tons of them. We don't have to label them, fortunately, but if we did, people would probably be just as scared as when we fatuously tell them if the, if the label in the processed food is longer than X, Y, and Z, don't eat it, or if your grandmother couldn't pronounce it, don't eat it in X, Y, and Z. No, that's, the, again, the wrong way to do it. Find the chemical that you're scared of, tell me why you're scared of it, tell me the studies that show its problems, and if you can't, then you are phobic, uh, and it's as simple as that. I'm not saying that every man-made chemical these days is going to be a wonderful addition to our diet. Far from it, I'm sure many of them are terrible. But let's be precise. Let's have precision, as Chris Cresser said on the first day. We need precision here. You need to name and shame or shut up. Um, and as an example of chemophobia, uh, take a popular amino acid in asparagus, take a popular amino acid in watercress, uh, add another carbon atom, and what do you have? You've got aspartame. And, uh, of course, I don't like aspartame because I think it tastes of the devil's salt and the devil's, uh, actually, the devil's soap, more like. And the problem with it is that, um, where, where, and when it breaks up in the body, it produces those two amino acids again, and a tiny amount of methanol, but certainly far less than you produce endogenously and much far less than you, produce when, than you consume when you eat an apple. So if somebody wants to tell me what the problem with aspartame is, they need, to, they need to focus on these particular facts and not just do a general scaremongering, which is, tends to be what, if you look at these online articles, there are. Uh, uh, the poor malign polyols. There are certain polyols that are 
quite bad for the gut, and there are certain polyols like sorbitol and so on that can turn into fructose and so on. Those are no good. But then people use that to extend it to saying, well, actually, erythritol is probably a bit naughty as well. Let's stick away from that. And what uh, that ends up being is they are just, it, it's, a, again, a kind of asceticism because people are afraid that if we admit there's a safe way to getting sweet in our diet, that can be a bad news story because we need to be punishing ourselves to a degree. And if we find a way of getting sweet and there's no karma to pay for it, something's gone wrong. Of course, if you're completely chemophobic, then of course you can have homeopathy because that's the only medicine where there is literally no chemicals at all. Uh, and I bring this up seriously because there's a problem with organizations like the Western Aid Price Foundation who are otherwise brilliant in also endorsing things like uh, homeopathy because we will never break the mainstream if that happens. You can't talk about the brilliance of vitamin K2 on one hand and then tell people that they can start to cure their cancer with homeopathy on the other. And, and the, these are both articles on the Western A. Price Foundation's website. It's not tenable. Uh, and then you go off into the deep end, and you have EMF paranoia, hardcore anti-vax, the GMO issues, and friends, a brilliant G, uh, GMO post uh, the other, uh, yesterday. Um, now look, there is concern about all of these things, perhaps, but it is uselessly misfocused, and we get written off as cranks. And, uh, and, and if you want to have a concern about these things, let's be concerned about the big deals first. Let's be concerned about the uh, huge epidemic of type 2 diabetes. Let's be concerned about getting people to stop drinking sodas. Then, if you're worried about the, uh, the, the puny amount of energy that's spouting out of your Wi-Fi router, fine. But let's, let, let's do some triage here. Um, and then there's the fallacy of balance. And I think we all know that moderation in all things uh, is, is a... Is, is a is a risible statement, and that Pascal's wager only works in a zero-sum game. Uh, but then we can have the dark side of this attempting to get back to balance, and w people who attack what they consider to be, um, uh, to, to, to be extreme. And I think we remember that particular uh, document from a poster from somebody in our community uh, when we, it was decided that keto was too extreme, and we get conclusions like that. That's, that, 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 that's, what key, that, that, that's a con of keto, by the way. It will kill you. And, and when you ask for proper, good quality data to back that up, you got references. But when you read the references, you realized they went nowhere. And that is a sad state of affairs because it seems that we, there was the desire to attack and debunk the perception of extreme to get us back into the cozy middle rather than anything else. And that was a sad moment. And finally, uh, I've got to be a bit quick, there was the noble savage insult. I attended an AHS a few years ago, and somebody said that uh, before agriculture, there was no violence in the human species. That, uh, that it was stated as boldly as that, and we had a lot to learn, because hunter-gatherers were a perfect society, and there was no violence in them. Uh, now, look, there are certain aspects of hunter-gatherer society that are certainly more egalitarian, and in many respects, agriculture was a disaster. But the problem when we sentimentalize people is that there's that nostalgia plus the idyllic yearning plus a kind of racism where you think, oh, these simple people have so much to teach us in the sophisticated West. N no, they are, they are complex people, as complex and compromised as we are and ever will be. And to attempt to look at these people as if they're animals in a zoo with lovely glossy coats is actually a little bit insulting. Um, so, in conclusion, how can we stop becoming them? And by them, I mean the people who both promote boxes of these things and think that boxes of these things are um, attractive. Um, and we can become them. We could become them. Um, we need to beware the beguiling narrative. We need to be aware of just-so stories the kumbaya and karma nexus that I talked about. We need to be careful about anecdotes that are just a little bit too delicious. And we need to be care about common sense because actually the more you look at pat prescriptions, the more you realize that when you dig deeper, it's far more complex and uh, far more difficult to ascertain what the actual truth is. And common sense is usually just a way of beguiling yourself into thinking you have the truth when you don't. Um, and also we need to remember that black swans do have babies. If we find that our favorite pet hypothesis is falsified, let's be very happy because the babies might be even more beautiful than their mother swan. Now, I want to, as I conclude, I say, well, what can we do to kind of mentally protect ourselves from all this? And I went back to the 1930s and the logical positivists, the um, Vienna Circle, 
And AJ came up with the phrase, the meaning of a statement is the method of its verification. Uh, now, there's a problem with the statement in that it, uh, again, chases its own tail and then ends up disappearing because you can't verify the verification is creed by itself. But it's useful for uh, more empirically based statements. And then they said everything else is metaphysical nonsense or poetry. So if you can't do that, then that's it. And they try to distill from science uh, certain principles, and that's what they did. Of course, there are problems with it, but it's a useful uh, way of looking at the world. So when somebody tells you grains are paleo, the meaning of a statement is the method of its verification. Okay, is that a meaningless statement? Is it poetry? Well, maybe what we can say is what that means is researchers in Italy found what appeared to be a grindstone in a cave. They dated the stones to 32,000 years, and washing off debris revealed starch particles. We can then go further. What is the uh, meaning of the statement? They dated the stones to 32,000 years. And you then start realizing, OK, that's how you do dating. And you get more and more to kind of closer and closer to raw sense data and to statements that you can verify for yourself. And if you can't get there, then at some stage, you have to start writing it off as poetic. So we need to decide which path we want to take. Do we wish to honor the best of our Enlightenment heritage in privileging rigorous empiricism? Or shall we just wallow in a bath of poetical, metaphysical, nonsensical jerfdom? Um, it's a decision we can all make. Thanks. Uh, I think we've got some times for questions, or if you just want to stand up there and shout at me, I'm very happy for that to happen as well. Uh, yeah, as someone with a background in philosophy, it's. Uh, perfect example of philosophy done well Thank your, you. your talk and is there, your talk was something that's been needing to be said for a long long time so thank you thank you and I want to make clear um, I, I know I can see uh, Angelo Coppola uh, sitting there and, and I know that um, you, you've, you've had to wrestle through a lot of these things yourself and I listened to your podcast early on and there's there is this temptation to um, kind of really sentimentalize nature and I, I befall it myself and you sometimes just have to realize, actually, second law of thermodynamics, the explosion of the sun, none of us are going to be here, the universe is going to die, and then let's take it from there, and let's en enjoy what we have at the moment. So there's a kind of a, it's like we're working for this final end narrative. And then we have to say, well, what is that narrative? Where does it actually end? And if it ends where I described, then let's bring it a little bit closer to now, and let's just enjoy the, the, the process of what we're doing. Um, next question. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate the vulnerability that you're showing Thank by, you. by being willing to stand up and say things that may may be viewed as unpopular. No, no, and, 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 I, and, I'm, and I'm very happy even for, for that to be the case, so uh, Good. thanks. Uh, my, you enjoy it is what you're saying. Good for yeah. you. Uh, so the, what I hear you saying. So the, the question I have is uh, I listen to uh, people that are critics of uh, science, like Gary Taubes, when they talk about the idea that the treating science as religion and setting such a high standard for changes in thoughts about what we accept as scientific fact um, can be relatively problematic and can lead to science becoming a form of a religion. And I was wondering what your thoughts were. Well, the way you stop science becoming a form of religion is with something like the verificationist creed. Because if somebody makes a so-called scientific statement, and you don't have a method of verifying it, then it is metaphysical nonsense or poetry. And this is actually a problem in deep science today. Um, string theory uh, it has no testable hypotheses. And people have said, well, actually, it's a kind of faith-based maths religion with um, a little bit of poetry built into it. And people are seriously debating whether it can be called science. So, yeah, unless you've got an empirical basis, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit Berkeley and an old-fashioned about that. I kind of, I won't consider it science until I can kind of kick my broken foot on it and see whether it, uh, I can refute it thus. Yeah, I was trying to refute things. Hi. Hi. I have um, a couple of comments more so than questions. The first sure. is the, the picture of, 
Asim Malhotra with the olive oil and the vegetables, and, and like you said, Rob Wolf um, has said that even, you know, he knows it's not about lean meat. He kind of says that to appeal to a broader audience to at least bring more people yeah, I in. Yeah, I said it was a bait and switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so at least they know. I mean, yeah, I think... Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so among the public, they get like, oh, paleo's healthy because they're eating vegetables. Well, we're also eating a lot of fatty meat and, you know, bacon, whatever. Um, uh, my other comment is with with the asceticism, I, I'm, I'm so with you 100%, and I think there's an element missing specifically with women. Correct. How dare we want to eat a rare juicy steak with a big fat cap on it? It's not ladylike, it's not feminine, and there's... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll have the salad with the light dressing on the side, and if I'm especially hungry, maybe I'll get some grilled chicken, yeah. skinless chicken. Of course. Um, so I was yeah. uh, no, I a hundred percent agree with you. And I actually had uh, I had a chat with um, Ivor Cummings, the fat emperor, just uh, and and it, and it was actually a woman who emailed and said, you know, this is like you say, it's particularly true about women. We w there's a different kind of fat shaming with women, and the fat shaming is we have to feel shameful if we eat fat, unless it's of course very cleverly disguised with sucrose and put in a tub and called ice cream, then suddenly it's all right. But if it's on if it's on meat then it's shameful. And I hadn't realized the degree to which women particularly are shamed. And when you look at um, the effects of not having these nutritious foods on uh, w women's endocrine system in particular, it, it, it's, it's, it's a complete tragedy. Uh, if, if you wanted to see something totally shocking about where all this came from, go and read Dr. Kellogg's stuff about the effects of meat on women. And you know how that basically turns them into lustful harpies. I think there was actual, an actual quote that I saw one of those things. Oh, I think I think veganism is the worst thing to happen to developing children and developing fetuses. But, but and then just one one more quick thing. Sure. Um, I just want to thank you for the chemophobia angle because people can shame me here. I am more low carb than I am paleo necessarily. I use Splenda in my coffee, mm -hmm. so I use a pack of Splenda, and that's gonna kill me. Like I felt like I had to hide. I had to go into mm. another room, pour my pack of Splenda, <laughs> and then go back out with the with the house I'm sharing with people. And, but that's, that's no good, but it's okay to have a 20 ounce smoothie with pureed beets yeah. and dates and coconut sugar, that's fine. That's fine. So and I wanna thank you for that no, because and, 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 and I agree with you completely. And, and what that is, that's more shaming. And that is really, and you hear this in our community so often, you shouldn't have the sweet taste because it will lead to cravings. Well, cravings of what? If I have something safe that I can eat that can give me my sweet taste, I get that hedonic reward. What's the problem? Oh, but you may go to the dark side and drink a gallon of high fructose corn syrup. No, I promise you, I promise you, Reverend Guy, and I won't do that. Can I have my splendor? Thank you. Last question, thanks. Uh, I think uh, paleo is as good as a template, but you have to kind of self-experiment yourself on yourself and see what works for you and what doesn't, and then adopt it. Now. I'm 73, so I don't have a lot of health headroom. And it turns out that strict paleo works better for me than, than anything else. So I've adopted that. And uh, so everybody's got to try it out and uh, see and modify it for what works best for them. As I said at the beginning, I'm not here to, uh, to attack paleo. I'm, I'm here to find out what's particularly, what is useful about them, what is good. And I I do still think if I, if I have to be pushed against all and stand on one leg and say it, I think it's, it's the way that paleo saves us from hyperinsulinemia, that's the, that, that is the best part of it. That's what I think anyway. And so the degree to which it does for you has worked. Good. La oh, so yeah. The very last, can we have one? A last oh, comment? Right. Oh, sorry. Love the language, Nick. Thank you, thank you.